Why do theatres insist on us performers being in the theatre an hour and a half before showtime? I just don't get it. Total mystery. It's the theatre, darling. It's tradition. You have to be here an hour and a half before showtime. And you must not whistle backstage. And you must never have a mirror on stage. And you must refer to it as the Scottish play. And you must wish each other bring a leg. Well, I don't know. All I do know is it gives me much, too much time for thinking. And I've been doing an awful lot of that since I turned 70. I think about the wonderful women I've known. Strong women, feisty women. Women that taught me all about injustice and activism. Great women. And I think about my career in music. Well, <laughs> career is it's a misnomer. How can you call something a career if its progress depends on who brings you up? That's not a career. That's called a life of music. I think about my life in music. And I think about the influence on it of illness, especially alcoholism. Oh well. My parents got married in 1930s Belfast. In quick succession, along came my older brother Philip, and when he was two, the Second World War. One day that family of three came home to find themselves homeless, thanks to the Luftwaffe's bomb. They moved to Port Stewart and I was born there in 1945. They gave me a name, I still got it, Keith. At first I didn't know who Keith was, so I cried and protested. But they didn't speak my language and I didn't speak English, so I lost that fight and I'm still Keith. We left Port Stewart where the wild Atlantic froth came blowing round our house like it was snowing and moved to Belfast. I missed the sea. I can't make light of what happened next. I still can't make sense of it either. Deep down it hurt for 58 years, bringing decades of addiction and secret tears. Was I bullied, abused, under a threat? What scared me? I can't tell you yet, but I felt everything changing inside. It was like a light had just died. The school days, so full of fright, I couldn't get anything right. She filled me full of such terror, I'd make endless mistakes and errors. Then she'd grab this little fool and drag me to the very back of the school, and a trapdoor over a hole. And she'd put me down, down little wooden steps, into a cellar full of coal. She'd slam the trapdoor. I'd hear her strut away, ranting, when I stood below in darkness. I'm only five. She's old and grey. How come she hurts me day after day? Three years of school. In all that time, I've learned just one thing. How not to cry. Once I was so full of dread, I ran home and hid under the bed. No use. Next day, I dragged off to school and stripped out the hole with the coal. I had to find something new. I had to find some way of escaping the abuse. So, my six-year-old heart beating fast, I trudged all day around these Belfast. But my freedom lasted just that one day, for I was even a failure running away. Goodbye to all innocence. Fear steals my confidence. Panic becomes permanent and makes all my coulds couldn't. So I learn to live with tension, like a fifth dimension. But, no picture of sadness I'd paint. Angela's ashes, this end. Because, joy of joys, mum and dad knew something was up with one of their boys. One day, dad came home with a uke, a ukulele. He said, son, this is for you, look. Come on, look, this is for you. 
I'll teach you strumming of chords, and pretty soon you'll be singing the words. So I had to get used to the ukulele, but my father helped me all the way. And now we're back in 1930s Belfast. Twenty years before rock and roll. My mama married a rock star. Daddy played jazz on the banjo. He was Belfast avant-garde. A dandy in tux and bow. Real green as thick as lard. Twenty years before rock and roll, mama married a rock star. Yes, she did. In 1950, he taught me to strum. Wanted me to be like him. Learn those work on, learn those chords. Years before Tiny Tim, you're drawing beat so. You're playing it wrong so. I, I used to love that that friggin' song. In 1950, he taught me to strum. Wanted me to be like him. He wanted me to be like him. He wanted me to play like him. And so out of the list of the work came a skit that actually worked. At home I learned moons and dunes, chords and words and moony tunes. At school I filter out the noise. No useless talk from girls and boys. I finally found an escape from abuse, inspired and protected by my very own muse. Let music be my saviour, let it be my refuge and strength, my strange therapy. Please save me from the deranged behaviour of a mad old woman who wants to hurt me. Music has to save me. Big Brother Philip, a hard act to follow. A scholar, a golfer, a tall, handsome fellow. A lover of jazz, especially big bands like Artie Shaw's and Benny Goodman's. As soon as I heard those men and their clarinets, something resonated in my heart and head. Suddenly, I wanted to blow, not strum. Any chance of a clarinet? No. I suspected they hadn't the money. Then the unexpected. Son, we'll get you a recorder, okay? Nobody told me what I should do. Nobody told me what not to. So I figured out tunes slowly by ear until every single note came clear. <laughs> Practicing hard day and night until I had Benny and Artie's tunes right. But there's something else that jazz men play. I tried to find it hour after hour, day after day. It's like they play the tune and then they never play the tune again. They go off and into this other thing that only Louie and Ella sing. It's like an alternate melody. How could I solve this mystery? So far from jazz and yet so near, puzzled for almost a year. Until one day, enlightenment, what if I tried to experiment? I could make up a tune beat by beat and time it out by tapping my feet. If it's right, my ear will know and tell my fingers where to go. Ten years old, it's really me playing jazz on the BBC. I was left with 
Resentment, some anger, misplaced hate, until, until, the Christmas before I turned 12, my well, dad had a party and asked me to serve drinks to other friends and relations. And I had a tray of magic creations, gin with tonic, black curl with rum, took a wee detour into my bedroom.
What a sensitive, expressive clarinet player. There was absolute silence for Germain's to play. In the line of an adagio, his dulcet tones sang. But somewhere far off, I heard a door bang. Then the doors behind me burst open wide. The two tag boys strutted inside. Come on, Sammy, there's no boxing on here tonight. <laughs> Belfast and Thames putting culture to flight. This is what he read. I don't remember. 
but I must have got up to some bad behaviour because the police were called. And drove me to the hell that was Queen Street Police Station in the filthy wee cell. Cops showed me a steel door slammed. I was only a boy trying to act like a man. All of a sudden, crying like a child. Steel door open. I dried my eyes as the cop showed a very old trump inside. Shoes with no leather. Red coat with string. Old man and boy forced together. What'd they get you for, son? You don't look very old to me. I don't know, sir. But I did hear the words drunk and disorderly. He looked at me for a long time through roomy bloodshot eyes. Quit when you can, son. You'll not survive. Then he turned to go to sleep. And now I'm still wondering, was he me, back from the future, to deliver a warning? Tramp's warning, tramp's warning, tramp's warning, tramp's warning.
I knew I'd have to forgo the accursed drink for as long as it took to rehearse it. Mr. Johnson taught me Mozart's creation so well, I got a standing ovation. One month later in the Whitley Hall, Queen's University ran a new festival. And a night devoted to all strands of jazz, the Embankment Six, the first band on stage. I played the very first solo, what a blast! London's best, Tommy Hayes played the last. A month of Mozart and jazz, what a thrill, but all of my life was soon racing downhill. You know nothing about life, nothing at all. You're perfectly set up for a fall. You're in love with experimentation. You won't be able to resist temptation. Your ability to do something well is going to bring you to the gates of hell. I'll be there waiting for you. Come into the arms of Ethel Blue. Oh, oh okay. I'm 18 now, it's time to leave school. Where will I go? What will I do? Some people have any real consultation. I'm off to Dublin, to Trinity College, to learn more about the Greek and Latin. Yeah. Donald. Music is not something you can rely on. You need something to fall back on. You need a degree. How come I'm pleasing everybody but me? Reading Homer in number 40, overlooking the playing fields of Trinity. In front of me, pages of classical Greek, while in my head I'm trying to restrain the music. Odos means road, Odyssey, journey. What will my road be? What's my journey to be? Rough or smooth, wet or dry, prose or poetry? Abroad, it's the Beatles, the Who, and the Stones, while the scene in Ireland is all show bands. Trad jazz is an art that's suddenly dead. There's no place for a lad in this clarinet, so I went out and bought a saxophone. It took me a couple of months to learn it at home. I answered an ad in the Belfast Telegraph, sax player wanted. Then my life became classics in Dublin and pop in Belfast. Yep. I had my first disaster in 1964. Workman, who was somewhat surprised that I dropped in. He climbed up his little wooden ladder and he straddled the joists where the floorboards had been. And he looked at the payphone in the hall. He rifled his pockets for change. And he started money in, receiver, money in, down, down, down. Press button in. Hello, boss. Yeah. No, no. I'm here. Here. I'm here in Harold's Harold's Cross Road. Yeah. No, the job. The job is fine. No, no problem. It's just young fellas after falling through the floorboards. No, well, I had them up at the time. Oh, I didn't know he was going to come in the front door. All oh, right. It's, it's, it's just what I'm wondering what to do. Now, I'm lying below, and I can't feel anything. My legs, my legs have got completely numb. I can't feel a thing, so I can't move. And while he's having his mini forest upstairs, I'm having this mini tragedy down below him. And he's wondering what to do. Get an ambulance! Get one now! Oh, well, boss, he, he wants me to get an, 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 an ambulance. We, we better go on there. Well, I'll ring you later, let you know how we get on. Yeah. All right, you're open there. Puts the phone down, and he starts rifling in his pockets for more change. You don't need money to ring an ambulance! Dial 999! Anyway, after three months of crutches, I uh, got the price of a motorbike when I sued the Dublin Gas Company. Then my life became classics in Dublin, the motorbike, Pop and Belfast, the motorbike, classics and double the motorbike. Of the three, I like the motorbike the most. 
I got a great offer in 1965 to join the Green Mates. I thought I'd arrive. They were a kind of Jerry Lee Lewis style rock and roll band. Famous throughout the whole of Ireland. Fronted by the one and only John Keel. They had their own radio show. It was called Not So Green. It was on RTE. It was satirical and kind of hip. Uh, and had a decent listenership. I missed the band of my pals in Belfast, especially Eddie, the fine lead guitarist. As luck would have it, the Green Beats guy left. I rang Eddie and asked him to join. He took all of two seconds to think about it and then said, fine. And he moved to Dublin and the two of us moved into a caravan in the grounds of a boys' school in Monkstown. It was a great wee setup. We were in a walled courtyard and on the outside, of the wall was the school's open air swimming pool. What a line to throw out to chicks. <laughs> Bear in mind, it was 1966. Come back to our place, have a midnight swim, then you can stay in the caravan. I'd have come to your caravan. <laughs> Believe me, I thought you did. Did we have fun then? Did we what? I'll tell you the wee one. Four years in college, Nothing to show except a degree, and one memorable blow with Jerry Mulligan, Jazzman Supreme, the star of the American West Coast scene. He was in Dublin to trace his family. I was running the Jazz Club in Trinity. He said he really enjoyed playing music with me. That was worth more to me than my honours degree. <laughs> When 
You're in a big, big accident. There's a sound so thunderous, it feels like it's in your head. And it's followed by a silence so empty, for a few seconds you wonder if you're dead. First thing I became aware of was rain in my face. It took me a few seconds to work out that there was no windscreen to the car anymore. Then I smelled petrol and heard hissing noises. It took a few more seconds to work out that there was no bonnet in the car anymore. And I called out Eddie's and Paul's names. There was no answer. But Eddie kind of groaned a bit and then moved his hand towards me. So I held his hand. Now here's the thing. It's really, I don't know how to explain it, but I had many broken bones down here, my legs were trapped, and I didn't feel any pain. I was also convinced we were going to be burned to death. I smelled the petrol, I heard the hissing noise, and I didn't feel any panic. All I felt was a kind of acceptance, almost serenity. I don't know what protects people in those circumstances, but something does, whether it's spiritual or chemical, I don't know, but we are protected. So we sat there in this little country room, three of us, and after a few minutes, I felt Paul die. His last breath was no more on the side. Then people started arriving. Somebody ran off to ring for an ambulance. A great lorry driver, the first thing he did was disconnect the battery. He might have saved our lives. And an hour later, ambulance is there. Paul is lying in the tarpaulin on the side of the road. And as they're stretching Eddie into the ambulance, I saw my friend Paul for the very last time. Through the rain and the people milling around, his shining face seemed to be smiling. <laughs> Eddie's in his 
single bed attached to the metal frame. There's a gap, and then there's me, and I'm in plaster from there to there. Jack is in between us with a little table, and he's got the plates and knives and forks, and vegetables, and the roast chicken. So he starts into it, and he carves a good couple of slices of meat. Then the chicken skids off the floor, skids off the plate and lands at his feet. Well, we laughed and we laughed until we were crying because Jock couldn't reach it and neither could I. And we laughed and we laughed and we laughed some more while the chicken began to cool on the floor. Then Eddie said, that's our friggin' lunches. Jock reaches over one of Keith's crutches. We manoeuvred and manoeuvred. I gave the word, we launched them in flight and jumped up the bird. I love it. Were you drinking in hospital? Yes, Ethel. Even the nurses brought us drink. Sounds like fun. Well, it wasn't. We were in constant pain and our great friend had died. Okay, I get it. You were drinking to escape reality. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose you're right. I spent five weeks in that hospital. When I got out, I made a very bad decision. I elected to go back to the caravan and live on my own. That was midwinter, and it was so cold that you couldn't see out of the caravan because of the thickness of the ice on the inside of the windows. I spent most of that winter in bed playing the clarinet or reading. And I had to keep the car because the caravan was in the middle of nowhere. And I devised a way of driving the car whereby I'd lift the plastered leg to the hip into the passenger footwell and operate the other three pedals with the one leg. <laughs> Not good. <coughs> so this one day, the deviousness of the alcoholic kicked in. And I thought to myself, I could cheer myself up and warm myself up at the same time with an Irish coffee. So I went in the car, and I bought the ingredients for an Irish coffee. Bought a whiskey, a coffee, cream, demerara sugar. Now, I knew nothing about cooking. Well, I knew, I know a little now, but I knew nothing about cooking back then. All I knew about making an Irish coffee was what a barman had told me was, the glass has to be warm. Okay? So I'm hanging on my crutches, warming the glass over a naked gas flame. When the glass explodes, and I fall back, and before I hit the floor, I heard inside the plaster my leg crack. Wouldn't you think I'd learn a lesson then? Stop the drinking, get out of the mess you're in. Now you're out of hospital and on your own. That drinking helped with loneliness. I suppose it did. A month passed, and then another lesser disaster. I was asked to leave the caravan by the school's headmaster. I have to admit, he was utterly right because I bumped into my old friend David at night and invited him back to the caravan for drink and crack. What followed was farcical. Quite rock and roll, really. David drove his big Humber car into the school swimming pool. <laughs> Absolutely, years before Keith Moon did the same thing. Yeah. We went back to the Green Beach, but it wasn't the same. It's like trying to rekindle the dying flame. So nobody talked about it, we all missed our mate, and the band finished playing in <coughs> June 68. Then on the morning of the 4th of July, I got a phone call from Belfast. Your mother just died. Her death was sudden, inexplicable. No rhyme, no reason, no warm. These things just happened. A couple of days later, I stood with Philip and my father at my mother's graveside, our aunts all around us crying. Whew. My head was in a total mess, I couldn't think straight. Inside a few months, I'd been severely injured. Car crash, no money, lost my mother, lost my men. Life is a, a farce with hysterical madness, followed by tragedy and deep sadness. Yeah, this 
is, I'd like to play this from my mother, who listened to the squawks and squeaks of endless repetition of her teenage son learning the clarinet and never once asked me to stop. All she ever did was give me great encouragement. This is for her, blues for Denise.
beaten up at best. If I make it to the ladies, I'll be arrested. What do I do? So I just stood there, a bead of sweat popping out of every pore in my body. Then a coachload of blue-rinsed American tourists pulled up right alongside me. And I could see them all pointing and nudging. Because outside their five-star Dublin hotel was the scariest ever hooker from hell. <laughs> they seemed reluctant to get off their coach. Then I saw Mick O'Brien, our lead singer, approach. He looked at them, he winked at me, he put a pound down my cleavage, and we blinked up the street. <laughs> Six nights a week of performance and travel. By Sunday night, we'd all be unraveling. 32 counties on the island of Ireland. You'd see them all in two weeks from the inside of Shilba and Atlanta. Oh, what to do with all the money we made? What to do with Monday? And how, to spend, how, do, how do we spend the money? How do we spend Mondays? Our night off? Well, Monday was for madness and meds. There's only 24 hours till the next show I did. Hang on, Keith. I've been thinking about all the reasons you give for drinking. Abuse and pain, death and bereavement, and every time you want some divilment. Now you're escaping from music that's bad. That's as sad as I've ever heard. You're really all about running away and postponing reality to another day. Hmm. I don't know if you're being critical or factual. Back then we had one day off a week. Of course we drank. I needed it to have fun. Now and... you're drinking because you're shy. It helps you to be the life and soul. I understand. I'm not sure I like it when you try to be supportive, Ethel. What you don't know is that I was in bits, literally falling apart inside most of the time. I understand. Shut up, Ethel. Shut up. You understand nothing. I could have been... Somebody, I could have a class, I could have been a real musician, instead of what I've become, a drunk. I'm saying nothing. <sighs> Thank you for that. In 1973, towards the end of June, we played a gig in Ballybunion, County Kerry. When we came out from play at 2 o'clock in the morning, we found our driver, drunk and in a comatose state lying in the back of the van. I was the only other person insured to drive, so I started to drive from Kerry to Dublin at half past two in the morning. I don't know if you've ever driven that bit of the road between Limerick and Dublin at dawn in a van, but the sun is straight in your eyes and the visor in the van doesn't come down far enough. So every time I crested, the brow of the hill, and I was temporarily blinded. I don't know, I don't honestly know whether I fell asleep or was temporarily blinded, but I hit the back of the truck. The van skidded across the road, went down into a ditch. Well, for the second time in a few years, it took the fire brigade to get me out of a vehicle, and the convoy of ambulances took us to Port Leash Hospital. <sighs> when substance escapes from broken bones, it can get into your bloodstream, stop your heart and lungs. For two minutes and ten seconds, I was technically dead until Charlie McCormick came to my bed. Miracle worker, surgeon sublime, he gave me back the life that was mine. Thank you, Charlie McCormick. A young nurse used to help me. And I'll never forget her. She used to come to me in her time off and help me to learn to walk again. So she'd help me out of bed, very slow. And we'd get out to the car door, one slow step at a time for the nurse and the musician. Until one day, a scary apparition. Way down the car door, an old hippie was hanging off crutches, his long, thin hair straggling down. He looked twice my age and vaguely familiar. Then I recognized him and utter, utter hysteria. That's me. That's my reflection. How did I get into this condition? Just when I thought it couldn't be any worse. You weigh 75, 95 pounds, said the nurse. 
You drank because the morphine stopped and you were in terrible pain. I get it. I really do. Nobody knew much pain I was in. I'd come off morphine, substituted gin. I was living with a wife, although I couldn't live with myself. And nobody really recognized that I, at least for me, that I needed some kind of professional help. It seemed to me that every plan I'd ever had had gone awry. And it was at that very time I got a phone call to tell me my father had died. We'd become great friends, he and I. I'd even been his best man when he got married a second time. When I got the news, I felt very alone. I was working in the north of England. I felt very far from home. A kind of stranger drove me to London. I couldn't say anything. I just lay in the back of his car and drank a full bottle of gin. When I got to London in a one-star hotel, I got into some embarrassing bother. God, how I miss my father and mother. I'm ready to be your best friend. <laughs>
Thank you. 
phone call from Dublin and a tearful voice telling me that we'd all just lost my great friend Eddie. Alone in the house, I put the phone down. I must have a drink, staggering around, can't take it in. Then I remembered he wrote last week, where's this letter? I spent an hour rummaging through household rubbish. I eventually found it and tore in precious pieces. Through tears and with sellotape, I put it together. Eddie's last letter to be kept forever. A brain tumor took him. No warning, inexplicable. He left me three mysteries, three wondrous miracles. One, with no ticket or money, I left the US of A, technically a stowaway flying TWA. Two, within a month I'd met Philip Canaan, a lovely man who's become a lifelong friend. Three, I stopped drinking. I found it hard. It lasted six months, but it was a start. Eddie Boyd Campbell, the decentest man I ever met. Footballer, musician, singer, cyclist. I'm so glad I knew you. I'll never forget you and your big, broad grin and your kindness.
jazz record I got to make was with Noel Frank, the one and Mick, in Trent Studios in just two days. We called it Ozone. And we were amazed to be offered two weeks in London in Ronnie Scott's alongside Johnny Griffin. I was now on stage in the club that wouldn't let me in when I was 17. Yes. <laughs> Three months later, my great friend Betty said that she'd make me think a holiday that I needed a break. I drank on the way to London, to Athens, to Piraeus, to Icarus off the Turkish coast. One night we were sitting outside a taverna listening to a group of Queen's University Belfast students who were busking their way around the Mediterranean. They were playing Irish trial. I said to Betty, some of this makes me think of jazz. Then inside the taverna buying drinks, Greek music there really made me think. Greek and Irish music use intricate preparation that relates to jazz and full-blown improvisation. Excited, I told Betty of these thoughts. She said, when we're home, you really ought to speak to Dolan Money or Christy Moore for a start. So I did, and was enlisted into Moving Hearts. What can I say about Moving Hearts? A band that was at least the equal of the sum of its parts. Christy and vocals and drums, Brian Callum, and whistles and pipes, young Debbie Spillan. Arrangements by Lonnie, the Buzuki Ace, the genius of Tip, Paul O'Neill on bass. Arrangements on guitar, the great, great Declan Sinclair. We rehearsed every day upstairs in the back. It felt like a complex music experiment comprised of many different elements. Trad, rock, folk, jazz, a funky melange. How to combine them was the ultimate challenge. We worked hard at arrangements and Christie's songs of concerned injustice and pointing out the wrongs that isms caused both at home and away. Every one of us had a veto, so no one's beliefs were betrayed. I brought all of my horns in on day one to try to identify the saxophone or clarinet that would blend with the pipes. The straight soprano, happily ripe for range, but made the pipes even edgier. My rare curved soprano sounded a lot better. It was a present from my father, a family heirloom that was played in his band in 1927. play only a G and D, putting the sax and me into A and E. Not the hospital ward, mind you, the keys. The music was so complex, our fingers so fleet, it was a blur like a tap dancer's feet. We were attempting something quite extraordinary. For the sax, this was uncharted territory. in every sense of the word, especially when the band hit the road. The audience didn't know what to make of us. Yes, it's folk, it's trad, it's rock. Why label us? Moving Hearts lasted four long years, four hard albums and scores of tours. Barry Bunyan, Brittany and Quebec all played the very same week. The National and Dublin then packed for New York. Zero glamour, grueling work. Rarely at home, always on the go, then rehearsals with Christy or Mick or Flo. After four years, we had enough. We were losing money. Times were tough. The Queens and us saw our last band meeting. You can't imagine the depth of feeling. We were all exhausted and needing a break. But before we quit, we thought we'd make one last album, the final concert, The Storm, named for Christy, The Storm in a T-shirt. Love. 
loved and fought. I did tell you I'd stay with you to the end. Yes, you did, Ethel. Indeed, you did. I turned 40 in 1985, kind of surprised to be still alive. When I drink, it's with ferocity, recklessness, audacity, careless of enhanced capacity. Despair turned into mad hilarity. I played in Ronnie's, Montreux, Trinity Ball. I played to thousands in concert halls. I played to tens of thousands in Roskilde, Finsbury Park, Liston Varna, Glastonbury. I'd go on stage, utterly sober, eager to play, ready to go for my on-stage back in alley with a big water bottle full of mixer and vodka. I'm not surprised how far I fell or how quick I struck my personal hell because alcohol is a fair weather friend, brings you up for a while and then brings you down again. Gone were the days when drink let me use it to live with my childhood and help me subdue it. Now it used me, used me up, sent me tumbling falling asunder in crumbling depression. I do falling well. We can fall together. Alex went to stay with her mother 
I like it. I let myself tempt myself into a little old bother. I went into town to the bag of them, pints of stout, double gins. And a real strange quirk of fit, I bumped into Derek, an old music mate. Ah, Derek, smite twist, what are you having? I'm the water, Keith, and then I'm leaving. What? You want something stronger? I developed a problem. I don't drink any longer. I told him that I wanted to quit myself. He said, you can't do it without help. You really need to, to get help in order to do it. And if you decide to quit, I'll come running to help you with it. I told him I wanted to for the sake of my daughter. And I ordered more gin while envying his water. A year passed. I was driving the County Mono to Anna Carey, the artist's retreat. I stopped off to see some friends in Cavan. You know, we had the pub for years, truly got a little drunk. And the shame of this, but I got up the car, started driving. I didn't get far before I hit a parked car, and the driver was in it, and I drove on. The police were waiting for me in the next time, and they charged me with leaving the scene of an accident, drunken driving, dangerous driving. I spent four hours at the police station. I was falling apart. Strangely, all they wanted to talk about was moving hearts. And what a decent bunch of men, they drove me up to County Man and Mom. I'm probably the only person who's arrived in the arts retreat at half past two in the morning in the back of the police car. Following morning, I woke up with nothing. Certainly no dignity. I had no instruments, no wash bag, no change of clothes, no car. All I had was a hangover you could have photographed from afar. I decided I needed a cure, the hair of the dog that bit me. So I found out where the nearest village was and I started walking there. Now it was a beautiful, beautiful day, short of Tuesday, 1989. Clear blue skies, but I didn't see any of that. Over my head, following me every inch of the way, was a little black cloud of my own making. I got into the first bar I saw, and the scene was like a Samuel Beckett play. Everybody seemed to be waiting for something. This cast of four was a little old woman, still wearing her overcoat. She was so close to the fire, any closer she would be in it. And she had a cigarette between her fingers and a small whisker, muddy Wellington boots, drinking pints in two big gulps. At the other end of the bar was a neurotic, middle-aged man, well-dressed, talking to himself incessantly in a low voice. And behind the bar, bored out of her young mind, was a girl of about 14 reading a book. So I was cast member number five, and I sat at the back and just thought, how have I got to this stage? How have I got here? Crashed last night, all, the, all that police station, all that stuff. At about two o'clock, the kid turned on the television, sat behind the bar. It was the Oprah show, and the subject was alcoholism. And nobody paid it a blind bit of notice but me. I was riveted to it. People told stories of self-sacrifice on the altar of addiction. I identified with every single one of their stories. Every single one of their stories was my story. I'd done that, all that kind of stuff that they had done. And then they began to tell stories of, of hope, of redemption, of recovery. When I left the bar after the Oprah show, I walked back to Anna McCurry. I enjoyed the sunshine. When I got back to Anna McCurry, I rang Derek and he promised to meet me a couple of days later, help me to get helped. What was the name of the little town in County Mountain? You, Bliss. I haven't gone away, you know. Yeah, a couple of years went by until I had work in Denmark and Lisbon. Six days, eight flights, two ferries, two trains. When I got into Lisbon, 
I was hungry, exhausted, deranged. I kept reading the mini bar in the Lisbon Hotel for two days until I finally found a seat on an airline's plane on a blackout from hell that made me feel halfway insane. Three days at home before I could eat. I know it scared Alex, and it certainly scared me. Three days when a knife twisted rough in my gut, and even water made me throw up. Three days of secret tears and defeat, and I couldn't bring myself to go to a meeting. And finally I rang Carol, a good sober friend, and with help and support, I could begin again. What a shame. I thought you loved me. Yeah, ten years, ten years went by. Sorry, I have to address that. What a shame. I thought you would love me. Yeah, no, I can't live what with you. Shame. I can't live with you anymore. I thought you would love me. Go away. 1991, the 23rd of May, turned out to be a red letter day. It's the very last day I had a drink. It's the day I might just have started to think, I must do this. A last chance of sobriety, not yet probable, but a possibility. I can be dad and feel proud of it. Please give me the strength to quit. Then another chance conversation that promised further salvation. Sherry and Sheena recommended Kay, a counsellor. And I went to see her one Friday, then every Friday for fully five years. She helped me understand some of my fears. My chronic lack of self-confidence diminishing thanks to her reassurance. This is your five minute call, Mr. Donald. Then ten more years without ever drinking. Time for learning, time for thinking. Listening to other alcoholics and how they cope. Sharing their experience, strength and hope. But something inside me, not quite settled, something that occasionally rattled me, something I thought I have to get fixed in case addiction starts playing its old tricks. Then, one day walking the Ramblas in Barcelona, I thought, I'll go and see Ivor Brown, a retired professor of psychiatry. Decent man, he agreed to see me. We talked of escape from abuse into music and alcoholism. He thought I might be helped via hypnotism. I was a bit nervous about that. He said he'd be with me all the way. Ivor in the present, me in the past, brought back to school in East Belfast. Me in my 60s, but five again, experiencing the emotions I should have had then. I was trembling and I was aware of it, but with Ivor beside me, I wasn't scared. A little part of me was in his room, but the bigger part was back in school. Six months with Ivor, at long last, I had dealt with abuse in East Belfast. Shivering, shuddering, trembling, hurting, recovering, remembering. I experienced the emotions at 63 that had been denied to five-year-old me. But I got a curious new sensation of relief. I said to myself, I'm free. Thanks be to Ivor and to Kay. They helped me to live in a different way. Thanks to everybody who shared and helped me to defeat despair. Thanks to Pals and to Alex and to everybody who helped me to get fixed. Thanks, I love you. Thanks, I love you. I love you. Thanks.
I'm trying to do this show all over the place. And if all the audiences I play for are as good as you, I'll be a happy man. Thanks. Good night.